I, I propose we start. So welcome to this first water talk of the new term. Um, happy New Year. I think I can officially stay this till tomorrow, the 15th of January. So Happy New Year and welcome. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you today um, our water talk presenter, Dr. Sudhir Murthy. Uh, Dr. Murthy is the ex chief executive officer of New Hub Corp, a clean tech firm for technology consultant and technology development with a focus on assisting utilities with intensification of wastewater treatment, energy, and water reclamation. He's furthermore the adjunct senior research scientist at Columbia University and a senior vice president of the International Water Association. And he will talk today about redeploying existing wastewater treatment infrastructure. Dr. Murthy is a professional engineer. He has a master's degree in environmental engineering and a PhD degree in civil engineering from Virginia Tech and has over 140 peer review publications. Until May 2018, he was the innovations chief for DC Water and led the development and implementation of the authority's innovation strategy. Sudhir created, defined, and translated research and development into over a one billion US dollar new product, service, and commercial technologies. Much of the work led by Sudhir was steered through a worldwide open innovation approach that led to collaboration with universities, utilities, manufacturing and professional organizations. And these partnerships uh, span the globe, including besides the US and Canada, Australia, Europe, Japan, Singapore, China, India, and Brazil. These innovative projects were developed through novel approaches of public-public partnerships with other water utilities and through collaborations with private enterprises and universities. More than 80 master and PhD students from universities in North America, Europe, Australia and Africa were insourced to innovate at DC Water in a multifunctional and interdisciplinary setting. Uh, some of the examples of the technologies that he developed include di the Digestive 4 Demon AVN indents and the AAA technologies for wastewater treatment. Oh, that's, I think that's good. <laughs> I got that right? I, th I think we are good, right? Good. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm almost there. Sudhir furthermore led some teams. <laughs> He led some teams to win four research grant prizes from the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists for new technologies developed in wastewater treatment, and he received the Edward J. Cleary Award for outstanding service to the profession. He has also received several Water Environment Federation awards, including the Rolf Fuhrman Medal for Academy, Academia Practitioner Collaboration, the George Gascoigne Medal for Wastewater Treatment Operational Improvement, and the CAMP Applied Research Award. Now I'm at the end. So we're very happy <laughs> that Sudhir is here today yeah. with us, and please help uh, welcome me and help, uh, uh, join me in welcoming him to the floor. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roy. I, I've actually also collaborated with University of Waterloo uh, with Wayne Parker uh, uh, quite quite some, I think, right? A few 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 uh, few years and a few students as well. Um, uh, I, I've been involved with really, I think, uh, in the past 20 years with maybe 30 odd universities. Uh, it's been a pleasure, really working uh, um, in a utility setting, but, but with universities. Uh, you know, the, uh, the audience is r really at eye level. It's perfect uh, for me uh, because uh, um, it's, 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 it's great to see um, a nice group of you uh, uh, be, at, uh, be at this uh, presentation. How many of you are, um, have, have at least taken a wastewater treatment class? About 50% perhaps, okay. So, uh, uh, you know, part of my talk is gonna be quite big picture and some, some of it I'm gonna go really into the details. And, uh, and so uh, if, if, if I do go into the details, uh, uh, bear with me and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get, get out of that uh, at, at some point in time. So uh, what, what I wanted to do was, you know, I, I spent 16 years at one of the world's largest advanced wastewater treatment plant, uh, uh, at, at a utility that, uh, that owned and operated uh, one of the world's largest advanced wastewater treatment plant. It's, uh, it's called Blue Plains. And uh, we were involved in, uh, in the early years, we were involved in adoption of technologies. And then uh, in, the, in the past, uh, in the last six or seven years, of my uh, tenure at, uh, at that water utility, we started uh, inventing and developing new technologies. So, so I wanted to kind of take you through the journey to some extent, but also uh, to give you a sense on, um, you know, innovation is, is everywhere and uh, ideas are everywhere. It's, it's just 
really uh, in, the, in the water sector, there's an ab abundance of idea. It's not scarcity. It's just um, trying to find it. And, uh, and perhaps uh, some of what I'd like to show you is um, how easy it is sometimes to find, find good ideas that you can actually develop into technologies. Uh, the themes uh, of my presentation, I, I'd like to go through a little bit on the innovation cycles, uh, my perspective of the innovation cycle, um, uh, the inventive approach that we used uh, at, at DC Water, but then uh, even later on, uh, uh, when I, uh, in, in, my, in my current uh, um, incarnation of commercializing technologies, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about biological selection. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's something that is important in wastewater treatment, and I'll explain why. Intensification. Intensification is a concept where you do more with less, uh, or do do it faster. Uh, and so, uh, how how can you actually go about intensifying technologies? And then, of course, the core theme of uh, my presentation is energy neutrality. How 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 can you 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 know if you have an existing infrastructure? a wastewater plant, say, for example. How can you actually reshape that existing infrastructure? One, if it's just doing carbon removal to do energy, uh, to make it energy neutral, and second is actually how do you actually reshape it to do nutrient removal? And, uh, and, and that ties in with upgrading existing infrastructure, which is really uh, the, the, talk about, uh, the talk itself. And then uh, I'll end with a little bit of a recipe for innovation, uh, at least my recipe for innovation. So I'll start with innovation itself, uh, the uh, innovation cycle. Um, uh, you know, uh, Clayton Christensen, who a lot of you know and has written books on disruption, he uh, talked about, talks about the evolution of digital file storage. And, um, and, and, and when you look at digital file storage, uh, uh, many of you don't even know about uh, the floppy disk, but uh, uh, as, as, as we evolve through different versions of digital file storage, he called it fruit flies, right? And, um, and, and, and he called uh, the disruption cycle um, of, of file storage fruit flies because they evolve so, and, and, they, uh, and they, uh, they evolve so rapidly. Uh, so I was starting to think about what, what could water be? Um, is, is, uh, so I started looking at uh, um, the lifespan of different uh, creatures. Fruit flies live for days. So, um, you know, the uh, um, elephant lives for 70 years. So I said, maybe uh, water technologies are elephants, right? Uh, and maybe uh, their, their evolution cycles are, are much, much longer. Um, then uh, I started looking also at uh, um, innovation life cycles of, uh, and, and gestation periods of different animals. Uh, of course, the gestation period of uh, an elephant is, is long. So to innovate in the water sector, uh, especially if, if there are certain technologies, uh, the gestation periods could be uh, the span of an elephant if an elephant lives for eight years. And, 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 and that's kind of uh, hardwired into some of these uh, different technologies. So uh, uh, broadly speaking, uh, what, what I kind of developed, as, especially when, as, a, as a water utility manager, uh, was when you in innovate in a water utility, you need to kind of look at different life cycles of different technologies. Some of them are hardwired because if you build a, 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 a concrete tank, the life of concrete is about 100 years. Uh, so so uh, 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 some of these technologies, like a Boeing airplane, you, you, know, you can change things in a Boeing, but, uh, but some of them uh, just last for a long time. And, um, and so, uh, you, you could have a, a sensor in a water plant that's much more of a hair. Uh, the mechanical equipment, they have life cycles of a horse and the gestation period of horse. And, and, then, and then we have these long-lived technologies. Uh, the activated sludge process is, is 100 years old and it's still working and it's, it's doing well. Uh, they have the gestation of an elephant. It takes a long time to develop them, but they live for a long time. And so, so uh, so when, when you are um, looking at procuring, buying, or even inventing technologies, uh, we, you know, it's, it's good to kind of think through um, the hare, the horse, the elephant, not only in terms of how long it takes to in innovate and, and invent those things, but, but also how long they live. Uh, live. And so uh, you know, uh, uh, often in the water sector, 
you'll find people trying to sell hares as elephants or horses. And so, uh, and, 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 and to a fault, water utilities evaluate hares like they evaluate elephants. So, so uh, by the time we end up procuring a hare, it's already gone obsolete sometimes. And so how do we actually stay nimble with hares, but also understand the elephants and, uh, and, and especially manage the horses? And uh, in, in many cases, when we are looking at existing infrastructure, these, these elephants, how do you actually reshape that existing infrastructure with the horses and the hares and make it do something different? And most of what we have done in terms of invention, we've never ever tried to invent an elephant. We've always tried to work with the hares and the horses in that elephant and reshape the elephant. And you can do a huge amount of great innovation by, by reshaping the hares and the, uh, and the horses in the elephant. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you some stories of how we've done that, especially the horse. Because you know, uh, what's sexy in, in the water is the smart water. You'll see a lot of uh, companies uh, in the hair, in the business of hares. But, uh, but you don't see too much in, in, the, in the business of horses. And uh, I want to show you how, how you can actually invent uh, in, in that area of the horse. Uh, not, not really the elephant, not really the hare, but the horse. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you, can, you can summarize different types of technologies and almost predict which technology would be an elephant, a horse, or a hare. The other thing, uh, um, uh, to think about is often we uh, think of technologies in the vertical, um, but sometimes it's uh, interesting to think about technologies in the horizontal. Meaning, uh, if, 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 if say you have a water meter, and the water meter has got a horse, which is the meter, and, and a smart uh, element in the, ho uh, in the water meter, which is a hair, um, the, uh, the, uh, and, and you can verticalize it and, and create a water meter. But often uh, the, 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 the smart portion goes obsolete faster. So uh, uh, we went from a radio to wireless in a water meter and, uh, and, and, and that smart portion went obsolete. But the water meter itself lasts for 20 years. So, so, so when, uh, when you're a water utility, it's, it's useful to actually look at technologies in the horizontal and, uh, and, and procure our technologies in the horizontal, and the manufacturers usually try to verticalize it because, um, because you want to have the water utility sometimes buy the elephant or the horse, even though you're selling a hare. And, uh, and so, so there's that uh, tension between the supply side that wants to verticalize technologies and the demand side that wants to buy horizontalized technologies. So that's, uh, that's a concept that, 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 needs to, that, that comes in play when you think of these hares, horses, and elephants. Uh, this is the water utility and the plant uh, that I was involved in. It's a 1,500 million liters per day plant, uh, really the largest in the world uh, of its sky. I think uh, now in China there are several plants that are bigger than that, but, but this is right in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, uh, you know, if you go further out, you, you get the, the Washington Monument and the Capitol is uh, somewhere around there. And this is, the, this is where D.C. becomes Maryland. So right at the edge of DC. Uh, and you know, at this facility, uh, the challenge was uh, we'd, we had no room to grow. And, uh, and, and what we were really interested in was intensification, uh, really uh, creating massive intensification, factors of 300, 400, 500%, not 30, 40, 50% but really mass scale, uh, doubling the capacity of, 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 of a facility, and how can you actually go about doing that in a reasonable way. And I'll, I'll show you uh, uh, some examples of how, how you can actually go about doing it by, by really understanding uh, the fundamentals of, of some of those technologies. Uh, at, at, at the basis of intensification, it's often not the biology, it's rarely the chemistry. It's, it's the physics. If you can address the physics associated with uh, the technology or, 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 or the process, you can get huge intensification. And, um, and, and so, uh, so often you, you'll find people looking at wastewater treatment or water treatment, and, 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 and they are looking at the technology as a whole. But if you go down to what the core physics is, 
And if you address that physics, you can uh, usually get massive intensification and, and, and you can actually create uh, new inventive processes. Um, uh, the, uh, and, and, and some of all of these have been implemented by us at DC Water, uh, where, uh, for example, uh, uh, this is a thermal hydrolysis process where we, uh, where the viscosity was really the key for for intensification. And uh, and and I'll I'll go through some of that in in my presentation. But really, addressing the physics is key uh, to um, to intensification, and and you can actually create new inventive processes as a result. So again, imp improving the physics. Um, uh, that, that limits process performance, uh, can create huge intensification. And then uh, you can bring in the hairs. Uh, the hairs are very useful in improving efficiency of, of treatment. In this particular presentation, uh, I have a full presentation on the hairs, but, uh, but this presentation, I don't uh, talk too much about the hair. I'll, I'll mostly focus, uh, focus on the horses uh, associated with, uh, with intensification. And and, and really, the last one, especially in a wastewater treatment plant, because in wastewater treatment, we use bacteria, a lot of biology for treatment. And, um, and it's really unexplored. We are actually in the caveman days, the hunter-gatherer days of wastewater treatment in some ways, because uh, uh, we haven't gone from the proverbial apple tree in the forest to an apple tree in an orchard yet. Uh, we don't select. And, and grow our apple trees in an orchard, we, we, we just go and pick apple trees from forests. And so how do you actually affect biological selection in a meaningful way? Um, is, is really, we're, we're just starting to do that, and a, a lot of what we have been developing as, as technologies is really biological selection and growing apple trees in an orchard. So, so certainly um, physical factors, and we use those physical factors to grow apple trees in an orchard. Uh, I'll give you an example, uh, and I'll go a little bit more into detail on these technologies that we've developed. Here, for example, uh, are hydrocyclones. Uh, it's a technology called Indens. Uh, this is a piece of equipment that we've developed uh, for aerobic granulation, for example, where uh, the overflow of the hydrocyclone we waste, and we only retain the underflow of the hydrocyclone. And so we retain the heavier bacteria and heavier biomass, which is out here and we waste the overflow. And, and, and by retaining the heavier material, uh, if there are bacteria that have uh, material that are heavier, that make them heavier, we are able to select for uh, those bacteria that, that are actually uh, denser and heavier. Uh, and I'll give you an example of what kind of bacteria would be of interest there. Um, and so, 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 so that was a concept that we've developed to, uh, to improve settleability of sludge, but also select for bacteria. Here we use screens. Uh, to retain granules, uh, where we retain anamox granules using screens, uh, and, 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 and this is the non-retained. The anamox are these red bacteria, and you can see how uh, the anamox has been retained on the screens. So, so again, we use physical factors and physical forces to, to help select for biology. And, and then you can get massive, not, not, not 10, not 20, you can get 100%, 200%, 300% uh, intensification by, 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 man, by, by purely managing physics. Uh, and, and why do we want to do that? Uh, of course, if we intensify plants, then we can do more. So we can do more with less. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, uh, uh, so often, if you have a plant that just removes carbon, uh, and, and a lot of plants in uh, Ontario, for example, only remove carbon. But if you want to move towards nutrient removal, say nitrogen and phosphorus removal, how do you actually go about that? And, uh, and, and there are some easy metrics uh, for, for doing that. Uh, of course, this is the human body, human system, and we consume food in kilojoules, energy. And we, uh, we output about 1,700 uh, kilojoules of energy as, on average. And in a wastewater treatment plant, you are, it's divided into a liquid train, a solid train, and of course, we can uh, get energy from that. Uh, and, 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 and the magic number is usually, if we can get about 70% of carbon to move from a liquid train to the solid train, and the remaining 25% of that carbon uh, can be used for nutrient removal. So we use 25% of the carbon for nutrient removal and, and get the 75% to go to the solid strain. And then in that solid strain, one third of that goes to, uh, say, an energy process. That's enough 
for a wastewater treatment plant, a nutrient removing wastewater treatment plant to be fully energy neutral. And, and, and to give you a sense, in most cities where, where there are no industries, but most cities, uh, the wastewater treatment plant is the single largest energy user, single largest point source energy user in a city is the wastewater treatment plant. In DC, that, that facility, uh, uh, Blue Plains, was the single largest energy user. And at the same time, I can also say that if, if, we, if we follow this formula, you know, 70% going to the solids and 30% uh, percent, uh, going to energy, that plant could be energy neutral. So, uh, so why is this, uh, this, con this conflicting conundrum uh, in, in place? And, and how do we actually go about making those changes in, in our in existing infrastructure? And, and, and creating these massive convergences, we want to intensify the treatment process and at the same time use less energy. And, 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 and usually in, in water and wastewater treatment, intensification of treatment always has resulted in increasing the energy footprint. So, so if I went from a lagoon to an activated sludge process, I increased my energy footprint while I did intensification. And when I went from an activated sludge process to a membrane plant, I intensified my treatment footprint, but, uh, but then I, um, I, I, I started using even more energy. And so, so I want to go away from that uh, paradigm of intensification leading to more energy use, but, but then have this intensification, have massive intensification, but also at the same time use less energy. And how, how can you go about doing that? This is an example of a plant in Austria, Strauss, uh, uh, where uh, you have, this is a, call it carbon, uh, this is COD, 100% uh, COD going in, and you have an A stage process. It's a very, very high rate process growing bacteria, uh, mostly to grow bacteria. And uh, you have 60% of this COD that goes into the solid stream, and this B stage for nutrient removal, this is the nutrient removal process at Strauss and 14% of the COD going into, this, uh, 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 in, into the solid stream. You add them up, it's 74%, about 70%, and then, um, and then you have one third of, of forming methane, and this, this plant is energy neutral. So it's energy neutral without actually, um, without, without food waste, nothing. It's just energy neutral from the wastewater carbon itself. So, so that's, that, that, that's the magic, uh, and how do we actually go about doing this in a existing infrastructure? Say we have a, a plant uh, in, in Ontario or in Canada or in the United States, and how do we actually go about doing that? And so, so a lot of what we did was develop new technologies uh, to, uh, to create uh, a new technology out here to manage the A-stage process. Uh, technologies out here and, and, and so on, technologies out here. And, and that's, uh, that's a lot of what we've been doing is to reshape existing infrastructure, to intensify it, and to make it energy neutral. Uh, this is um, an example of a uh, um, uh, solids balance of, 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 of different activated sludge processes. This is a less than one day SRT, solids re residence time. This is 10-day SRT and this is 30-day SRT. And you can see that uh, when you go less than one-day SRT, if you grow bacteria, uh, which is this, is this is the bacteria that you grow and you keep some food there, uh, the amount of CO2 you produce is very small and most of what you produce is yield. At a 10-day SRT, uh, you have produced basically half of your uh, in carbon coming in is converted to CO2. At 30-day SRT, it's, it's more than three quarters is converted to CO2. So how do you actually minimize the production of CO2 uh, in the liquid side process and send as much of it to the solid side process, while at the same time send enough for nutrient removal? So this is an example of um, uh, a treatment scheme. This is what is at most treatment plants, uh, where you have a primary settler that removes carbon and you have an activated sludge process uh, that does nutrient removal. And, uh, and here is an example where you are trying to get about 80% nutrient removal. Um, in, in this case, it's about 70%. 28, so, so about 72% nutrient removal uh, is achieved in this configuration. And so you have about 100 COD coming in, 100 nitrogen coming in. You have no COD produced at the, in the um, 
in the primary settler because it's a phys physical process. You have 33% COD in the sludge, 8% nitrogen, and then uh, and you have 67% COD going to the biological process, and then you add up 100% nitrogen with the site stream, 115, and so you have about 107 nitrogen, and, and you have the COD to nitrogen ratio of 8.3, and, and then you have the activated sludge process, and there's a lot of CO2 produced out here, 40%. And when you add them all up, this is a typical wastewater treatment plant. The, the amount of COD that you can add up in, that goes into the sludge is about 33 plus 24, which is around 57%. No, not, nowhere close to the 70 or 75% that you need uh, to get, become energy neutral, but also at the same time to do nutrient removal. Uh, this is a typical AB scheme uh, that, uh, that I talked about in Strauss, and, and, and uh, for that same uh, balance, and if you were to use an anamox side stream process, now you add up uh, the COD, uh, it, it approaches that 70%. Uh, but, but your COD to nitrogen ratio is about 6.7, so you, now you have to do carbon efficient nitrogen removal. And then, uh, and then if you have some of these other configurations, you can even do, do better. So here in this example, you have about 75% uh, COD removal. Um, uh, for, for, uh, for, for energy recovery or, what, or whatever you need to do with that. So, so a lot of what we were trying to do is uh, reshape wastewater infrastructure, but then rather than destroy this technology, how do I convert a primary clarifier into, say, a AAA process? And what do I do with my existing infrastructure and, and convert that into something different? And... Uh, and so, so you, you have a carbon step, you have a nitrogen and phosphorus step, and then you have your solid step. This is, for example, the Blue Plains plan, and how do you actually reshape each of these steps and do things differently? And that's what uh, we was, uh, you know, the billion dollars of expansion and uh, improvements that we had at, uh, at Blue Plains was really a little bit about um, intensification, but, but also uh, moving towards um, uh, carbon, carbon efficiency. So uh, the first example uh, I'd like to talk about is this uh, uh, physics of flock filtration. Uh, this is uh, uh, my co-inventor, Bernard Vett, uh, who was involved in this concept. Uh, this is a plant in Germany, Rottenburg, where we convert, where what we do is we convert existing primary clarifiers into a biological process. And now, uh, at, right now, we have two full-scale plants and three, uh, three others being built and a fourth being designed. So, uh, you know, the, the, the pie chart I showed you, um, as you increase the solid residence time of a process, as you go from zero-day SRT to two-day SRT, there's a point at about a half-a-day SRT where you actually increase the yield of, of, uh, of, of, of the process substantially. And if you operate the process right around here, you have a lot of uh, carbon being produced and sent to... Um, uh, to the sludge process, very little CO2 being uh, so 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 very little CO2 being produced, but 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 enough CO, uh, COD going into the effluent for nitrogen removal. So you want enough uh, going to going for nitrogen removal, not too much CO2 produced, but 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 a lot of yield produced. And this is what we call uh, the the A stage or the adsorption process. And so what we wanted to do was replicate that in a primary clarifier. So uh, we, uh, this is a typical rec rectangular cl uh, clarifier. Um, we, we would uh, take, say, for example, the, the sludge hopper a part of that, convert that into a, uh, a gravity thickener, and then, uh, uh, and then operate an A-stage process in that same primary clarifier. And we've done that in a rectangular, and we're doing it in circular primary clarifiers. And what happens out here is, uh, if, if we were to just do it in a typical uh, plant and, and do it in the hydraulic profile of a plant, and we want to put in a, a, an A-stage process, it just doesn't fit into a hydraulic profile. So you want to work with the elephant, but create your right horse. And so, so what we've done is we've uh, developed a constant water level process where we feed and discharge at the same time. So the level of the tank doesn't change at all. So if you don't change the level of the tank, then... Um, then you don't change the hydraulics of the elephant. And, uh, and so you can convert an existing tank into, um, 
into a primary into, um, into an SBR, a constant water level SBR. Uh, and, then, uh, and, then, and, and, and then add air in here to actually grow the bacteria. So we, we convert the primary tank into an A-stage process, and, uh, and, and, and we use the existing infrastructure. And, and then what happens is where the physics comes in is when we feed the sludge in, and if we feed it from the bottom, the, the biomass out here acts like a flock filter. And, and relative to a conventional A-stage, you can actually remove a lot more COD and capture a lot more COD using a, 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 a what we've called this a AAA process than, than, a, uh, than an A-stage process where, say, if the influent comes in right out here, uh, it doesn't take advantage of the flock filter effect um, of, of an A-stage process. So, so we have a, a, a flock filtration uh, that occurs here, while at the same time, we have converted a primary into a, a, a process that can actually um, send a lot of carbon uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, the, to the anaerobic digestion process. The other thing that it does is when you create bacteria, bacteria has much more nitrogen in it than, uh, than, uh, than particulate material. So if you have uh, particulates coming in into the influent, it usually contains about four to six percent nitrogen. Bacteria contains 12%, 10 to 12 percent nitrogen. So you're sucking up the nitrogen and sending it into the sludge, but you're also sucking up the carbon. Uh, and so by doing that, you're sending more of your nitrogen into the biological sludge processes um, where, where, where it can be treated uh, more easily uh, relative to uh, a more dilute stream where you have to treat the nitrogen in the liquid process. So this is a, a plant in Italy uh, that we've converted. Uh, this is uh, the, the sludge hopper uh, that we have converted into a gravity thickener in Alta Badia. It's in the Dolomites in Italy. And, uh, and then we put in these uh, decanters uh, uh, to, to, to withdraw the, uh, the effluent. The, uh, the, the, the second, uh, so that, that's the flock filtration concept uh, that we've integrated into an A-stage process uh, to, to improve and convert uh, existing infrastructure. Uh, another example here is the indents. I, I talked about the hydrocyclones already. Uh, this is a col collaboration. Uh, this is Charles Bott. Uh, uh, the innovation manager of Hampton Road Sanitation District, we, uh, we, we, we started looking at hydrocyclones um, uh, to improve settleability uh, about, I think, seven or eight years ago. And, uh, and, and, and the concept there is if, if I can, this is a flock density uh, per call, if I, if I can differentiate in a hydrocyclone densities between 1.01 and 1.05, just, just small changes in density, I, I can create classification. Then I can have the heavier activated sludge material come out in the underflow, and then uh, in the overflow I have the lighter material that I waste, and then I can improve settleability of the sludge, just, just by the physics of sedimentation. And, um, and so we started implementing it. Now there are about 20 plants uh, all over the world already implementing this intense technology, uh, where uh, if you look at this, this is the influent, this is the underflow, and this is the overflow, all of the same uh, concentration. And, and by, by just wasting the lighter material, you can then improve the settleability. And then this was the first plant where we noticed, uh, of course, this is uh, where um, this is the SVI for the, uh, say, the, the, before we implemented the hydrocyclone, and this is the SVI. SVI is an indicator of settleability. A low SVI means good settleability. Sludge volume index. Uh, and, and we saw improved SVIs uh, for two years in a row, um, and, and thereof um, compared to uh, uh, before the implementation. And, and, and in that plant, what we also noticed was this, this plant was not designed for biological phosphorus removal, enhanced biological phosphorus removal. These are these bacteria that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that are able to uh, retain large amounts of phosphorus inside the bacterial cell, and, and the phosphorus that they include uh, in the bacterial cell have counter, counter cations, usually magnesium and phosphorus. 
And, 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 and when you have these, uh, this phosphorus, magnesium, potassium uh, in surplus quantities in the bacterial cell, we believe that that makes them denser. And, uh, and, and so we were, this was the first plant when we, when we started looking at things in greater detail. This plant was using poly uh, uh, sodium aluminate for phosphorus removal. And uh, this is June of 2013, so it's about seven years ago. This was the first uh, incident where we stopped adding any aluminum and, uh, and, and we were getting great phosphorus removal in that same period when we started, stopped adding aluminum. And so, so th the indense process was able to actually not only um, uh, improve settleability, but was actually uh, doing biological selection. And, and once you actually get biological selection and manage biological selection, you can actually do a lot of uh, new things. Uh, so just improving settleability is one thing, but then now, now I'm able to convert an existing plant into a biological phosphorus removal plant. Um, and, and, and to give you a context, if, if I were to use a concept like this, which is a piece of equipment, I can then combine this piece of equipment, my horse, with these elephants, and, 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 and you can really transform existing infrastructure to aerobic granulation. Uh, so you can get aerobic granulation with, within any existing infrastructure rather than create an elephant associated with aerobic granulation. Now all my elephants are combined with my horses to, to form form that. Uh, this is a large plant we've been working on uh, in, in China. We have a very large plant in Poland that we've converted. And then now, uh, right now, we have been working on several large facilities in the United States, all existing infrastructure, which we are converting to aerobic granulation. Again, 100% uh, intensification. We're not talking about 10, 20, 30%, but 100% intensification. Uh, this is uh, the Animox that we were retaining on these large screens. Uh, this is a rotating drum screen uh, that we developed. Uh, again, uh, we, we started um, with a sieve in the lab. Uh, we had a couple of st grad students, uh, some of them out here, uh, just sieving the, uh, the Animox and, sh and, and seeing what was retained and what was, uh, what was passed through. And, and, and from a, just a sieve, um, in the lab, we converted uh, to these large drum screens uh, in a matter of two years. And um, uh, to, to actually select for Animox, these are very, very slow growing organisms, uh, and, and then let the uh, flocculin material pass through the screens. And so now I have two different SRTs. I have biological selection of these slow growing organisms that are very efficient autotrophic organisms uh, relative to uh, uh, the flocculent organisms. And I'll explain why. Uh, some, of, some of the uh, conundrum of wastewater treatment is we add energy, we add electrical energy to remove chemical energy. That's, that's what most wastewater plants do. We add electrical energy to remove chemical energy. And in this case, the chemical energy, say for example, is ammonia. It has got uh, chemical energy. And we add a lot of electrical energy in form of air to remove this chemical energy. And, 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 um, and so we convert ammonia to nitrite to nitrate by adding a lot of energy. And then we add more energy in the form of carbon, and usually it's a, a organic carbon, to remove nitrate and convert it to nitrogen gas. So ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. So we, you start off with energy. We use energy to remove that energy and then we add more energy to remove uh, that product that we created by adding all of that energy. And so that's, that's uh, nitrogen removal in a nutshell. And that's most of the nutrient removal plants do that. So, of course, now you can do a shunt process where we can uh, avoid that nitrate step and go as a shunt to this process. And then the last approach is the Animox, where you can use ammonia, add a little bit of air, from some nitrite, and then the combination of that, those two, but it's a slow-growing organism, converts to nitrogen gas. And so this organism grows so slowly, uh, to actually make it efficient and intensif intensified, you actually had to uncouple and do that biological selection. And so that's what we did. We created the, this concept of screens, where we screen them, and let the flocks go through, and we only retain the animox, and then we were able to actually 
grow those slow-growing organisms and the fast-growing organisms in the same system. And uh, uh, right now, uh, uh, we have, this is the demon process that we have developed. There are over 100 uh, plants. Um, and, uh, and in the past 10 years, uh, pretty much, I think, 50% of all plants worldwide are the demon process um, using this Animox organisms. And this was the first plant uh, where, the, where it was uh, installed. Um, this is some data. Uh, we feed the Animox into the screen. This is uh, Animox organism. This is the amount of Animox that passes through the screen, and this is what's retained. And uh, these are uh, some of the other organisms uh, that we feed through the screen. These are what passes through, and these are what we retain. So we retain all of this, and, and, and we retain most of the Animox. And, and by doing that, this, this plant, uh, which already had the Animox process, went from a loading rate of 0 0.6 kilogram per cubic meter per day uh, to higher than 1.2. They just ran out of wastewater uh, by, 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 by retaining the organisms on the screen. So a huge intensification. We did a trial just to understand where it could go, but we, we even out here kind of ran out of uh, wastewater, but, but, but we were at 1.5 kilogram per cubic meter per day. Again, uh, in huge intensification by, by doing that. And um, uh, this is some of the implementation history of that technology um, by, by, by creating that, that huge intensification. I want to uh, uh, switch track to the sludge area, uh, talk about viscosity. So you know, we talk about um, flock filtration. We talked about uh, sedimentation physics, the physics of sedimentation, the hydrocyclone. We talked about compressibility, letting the compressible material go through while retaining the non-compressible material. Uh, I want to touch on viscosity, um, another physics for horses. Uh, uh, we were interested in um, creating a, 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 a biosolids product that we could uh, recover and market. Right now uh, at DC Water, uh, they have created the product called Bloom that they market uh, and in, in gardening, gardening stores. Uh, and, and to create that, we needed to create a, a sterilized product, but also we, we didn't have space to actually build all of that, so we needed intensification. Uh, this is a picture of uh, how slow uh, sometimes uh, technology development can occur. If, if you don't understand or use the right physics uh, associated with that technology. Uh, in 1978, uh, Tim Hogg, uh, and uh, this was actually Perry McCarty, uh, actually studied the first, this was the first paper, effect of thermal pretreatment on digestibility and dewaterability of organic sludges. So that was 1978 when the concept of thermal hydrolysis was uh, first envisioned. But, but in 1978, they did not look at viscosity. They, they, they were digesting sludge, uh, thermally hydrolyzed sludge at three, four, five percent uh, solids concentration. They didn't think through and see that at five percent sludge or at 10 percent sludge, the viscosity of 10 percent sludge that was thermally hydrolyzed was the same as the viscosity of 5% sludge that was being sent to digestion. And, and, and usually in a, in a sludge digester, if, 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 if something is too viscous, uh, you can't mix it, you can't uh, uh, put it through the digestion process, and, um, and you can't pump it. It's, it. So viscosity creates a lot of hurdles in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sludge process. So if I can address the viscosity, it's not, it's not how digestible it is. If I can just purely address viscosity, I can go from a 5% sludge to a 10% sludge or even 12% sludge, and I can double my capacity of my digester. That's 200%, right? Uh, I can get uh, uh, in terms of uh, maybe not 200, but uh, well over 100% intensification of, 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 of the process by just addressing viscosity. And, and in, in 1978, uh, the concept was developed, but the first time they actually looked at addressing viscosity was 1995, 96. And, and when they looked at viscosity and they addressed that, that this process can actually address viscosity, then the process took off. It was not the biology of the process that led to its success. It was the physics of the process 
that led to uh, the, the, the success of technology. So, so if I can increase my throughput rate, then, then, then it becomes a winner. And, and, and then I can double my uh, treatment capacity uh, and not by just increasing the amount of gas produced. So, so, so that was uh, the concept and, and you can see since then uh, the, te the technology took off by addressing the physics and not the biology. And, uh, and this is just a, a, a lab study where uh, this is the feed before thermal hydrolysis is the viscosity of that sludge after thermal hydrolysis, I drop the viscosity to much more of, uh, of a reasonable viscosity, and then I can, uh, um, I, can, I can digest the sludge easily. And this is the installation at DC Water uh, where uh, uh, we install that technology. Um, and, and of course, uh, some of that product is being used now in green infrastructure, in farms, but we've also created bag products uh, DC Water has also created bag, bag, bag products for, for use. And uh, through this in intensification, you can go from one cubic feet of biogas per day per cubic feet of tankage to as high as three cubic feet of biogas per day per cubic feet of tankage. Massive intensification uh, by, by just addressing viscosity. Uh, another physical factor that we looked at was flocculation. This was in, in the context of dewatering. This was a joint project with Thames Water, uh, this Paul Fountain of Thames Water, this Matt Higgins of Bucknell University. Uh, we were looking at belt filter presses. Um, again, very conventional. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about fancy technologies. These are reasonably conventional technologies, but, but getting massive intensification. Uh, uh, from thermal hydrolysis, these are plants in the United Kingdom. They were all producing about 30% cake. So for whatever reason, and we have some ideas, the thermal hydrolysis was producing about 30% cake regardless of belt filter press or centrifuges. But the throughput rates, both in centrifuges and belt filter presses, how much you can put in was always quite low. Uh, here it is 200, uh, in, in the range of 200 to 250 kilogram per hour per meter of the press, loading rate of the press. What we noticed there was when, when you did thermal hydrolysis, you broke up that sludge into really fine particles. But, uh, and, and, and by breaking up that sludge into fine particles, you actually released a lot of water, and therefore it, it, it dewatered well. And that was highly desirable for a thermal hydrolysis cake. So it, 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 it dewatered really well. But, um, but on the other hand, uh, the throughput rates were low. So it, it just occurred to us that maybe these, and, 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 and what we noticed was the filtrate solids were very high. So, so uh, the, the solids were appearing to go through the press. So what we ended up doing was we, we put a flocculation step uh, ahead of the dewatering step. And by putting just a flocculation tank, and this is the full scale flocculation tank at DC Water, uh, we were actually in, in, in this trial at, uh, in, 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 in the United Kingdom with Thames Water, we were able to go from the 200 I talked about as high as 800. In fact, we, we didn't know uh, if the press could handle greater than that by just addressing flocculation. So again, you address the physics of flocculation, the particles disintegrated, bring them back together, and then you increase the throughput rates. Uh, so uh, just, just in closing, uh, a lot of what we have done is, of course, uh, through open innovation. Uh, we worked with regulators, we worked with universities, we worked with manufacturing, we partnered with other utilities. Um, almost all of our inventions and technologies that we have developed is uh, through our open innovation model. And, and a key aspect of open innovation is, is really to focus on abundance and not on scarcity. If, 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 if we focus on, on the concept of scarcity that if someone's taking something, I've lost something, you lose the game of open innovation. You have to focus on uh, values of abundance, that we are all doing it and we're creating additional value. And, uh, and, and open innovation models work that way. Uh, one last concept that I wanted to uh, show. You know, we talk about diffusion of innovation. Uh, that's a concept that, that's out there. I really think diffusion is too slow a process. We need dispersion of innovation. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, from 1 AD 
1680, the increase in world GDP was about a factor of 10. Around 1680 was a statute of monopolies, uh, the, the first patent law in the United Kingdom. And since then, uh, really the, uh, the world GDP has increased by a factor of 10,000. That's, if, if you use energy, such as through, uh, through patents, you can actually uh, increase, um, increase world, uh, you know, you, you, it's, really, it's, it's really the scientists and engineers it's the, that were in charge of the Industrial Revolution. And, uh, and, and, and really, we need to work together to actually develop more and more of these technologies uh, through, 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 uh, through incentives and uh, approaches that make sense. You know, uh, when you look at uh, uh, developing technologies, um, it's, it's, it's um, really uh, uh, not just inventing or creating a patent. Uh, within, within an iPhone, you have multiple IP in that iPhone to create a solution. Um, so you may start off with finding a problem and solving a problem. And in most of our education system, that's where we stop teaching people. We, 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 we show them how to find a problem and solve the problem. That's what we call engineering. But, but really, uh, there, there's a lot more after that. There's developing an idea, um, developing the IP associated with that idea. Uh, you know, I might have an idea that, OK, I'm going to increase the density of my sludge. But then converting that into a piece of equipment, going from an equipment to a technology, uh, you know, for biological phosphorus removal, say for example, and then arriving at a solution. Uh, we 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 really do not teach our students how to how to patent. We teach the students how to write a paper, but we never really te teach our engineers. If 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 the world GDP increased by ten thousand because of us engineers. Um, we, we don't do that good a job uh, of, 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 of teaching them how to develop uh, intangible assets. This is a recent econo Economist article, 2018. Uh, the market value of S&P, market value of intangible asset in 1975, when it was mostly horses manufacturing, was, was around 20%. Today, if you include trade secrets and IP, uh, the market value of intangible asset is 80%. We've completely switched to an ideas and uh, intangible asset oriented economy. Uh, we have to really change how we teach our students um, uh, how, to, how to file patents, how to create ideas, what is the trade secret, how to actually build and develop those, those new technologies. And, and, and you can do that in water quite easily. And with that, uh, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you for questions and thank you. thank you very much. So we've got time for one or two questions. One sec. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's very insightful. Um, very interested. A very interesting idea that you brought up with the whole thermal pretreatment and how that affects viscosity more than uh, biogas production? Because I, I have a, uh, I'm currently working with more uh, of anaerobic digesters, so thermal treatment in, in my mind was always more about bring out more gas from the, so, so could you elaborate a little bit more on how that viscosity helps uh, um, wharfs and treatment plants as opposed to the, the gas production? And um, also on your, uh, the watering side. I was wondering if you can couple that maybe into into the into the question on mm. whether the the, the dewatering would be before the digester or after the digester. That, that's one you were talking about. So just interested mm. on your take on that. So um, yeah, very very, very quickly, uh, and uh, I'll try to answer that. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at uh, increasing gas production, for example, yes, uh, thermal treatment increases gas production, but the economics of that additional gas hardly pays for the process itself. Because uh, I cannot pay for the process using the economics from that additional gas produced. But if I can say that I need to build less digesters, and I, I only need to build, build half the digesters, uh, 
I can, I, I can move my economics towards using that technology because now I can, the, the, the savings from that, those half the digesters that I've not built, I can use that to build my uh, treatment process, right? So I can build the thermal process with, with only half the digesters rather than just relying on gas production. So by, by relying on gas production, uh, all I do is produce gas and, uh, and yes, I can produce power or I can, uh, I can pipe it, but, but the sale of the gas is not enough to justify the technology. But if I can now intensify the process and, and build half the digesters, those are expensive uh, concrete structures that I don't need to build. Or I, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so then I can have these huge savings. So, so you have to look at those savings from that perspective of, 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 of real infrastructure mm -hmm. rather than just looking at incremental gas production. Yes, you will get more gas production, uh, but, but that doesn't usually justify the technology. And, 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 and if you look at the world of sludge reduction technologies, it's replete with a lot of technologies, mechanical treatment, chemical treatment. They've all been focused on gas production. They have not been focused on viscosity reduction. And, and if you start looking at viscosity reduction, then I can lo load up my digesters. I can double it and triple it, maybe, and, uh, and then produce that, the savings from that to pay for, uh, for the technology. Uh, for dewatering, uh, uh, it's, it's really about uh, understanding uh, what was resulting in the low throughput rates uh, for, 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 that for, that, for that technology. And uh, our observation was most of the operators were throttling their, uh, uh, their, their the, 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 the full-scale uh, equipment because they were seeing a lot of filtrate solids, solids in the filtrate. So it, it was just, from, from our perspective, um, uh, they weren't throttling the equipment because, um, because they weren't able to get high cake solids. They were throttling the equipment because they were seeing high filtrate solids. So for us it was, okay, how do I address those high filtrate solids? So then we put in a flocculation zone and when you put in a flocculation zone, you address the filtrate solids, and then, then we realize that you could actually load it much higher than, uh, than, than traditional, uh, um, uh, tra tr for, for traditional sludges. So now you could go from 200 to as high as maybe 600 or 800. Okay. One last question. Uh, so often when you propose to municipalities the idea of the carbon diversion to, to get more into the sludge, the response is, um, well, we, we get too much biosolids and that causes us problems. So uh, could you comment on what DC Water's experience there was in terms so, of? Yeah. So ca carbon, uh, the, 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 you, you, if you don't have anaerobic digestion, certainly if, if you don't have anaerobic digestion, you will produce more sludge. Uh, and so, uh, the, the, the whole concept of carbon di uh, diversion has to be coupled with a carbon management strategy in the sludge. Uh, so if, if you have a carbon management strategy that does not include, say, a digestion, digestion process, then, um, then, then, uh, then, then it doesn't make sense at all. But, but, but if you look at, uh, uh, it's, it's this 80-20 rule. 80% in, in, in North America, 80% of um, wastewater is treated by 20% of the utilities. And 20% of the wastewater is treated by 80% of the utilities that are very, very small. If I can get 80% of the wastewater that are treated by these large 20% utilities, Toronto, Peel, uh, you name it, they all have anaerobic digestion. And uh, because the large plants usually have anaerobic digestion, maybe some have incineration, but, but most of them have anaerobic digestion. And when you carbon divert it and you produce more gas, the amount of yield at the end, the, uh, the, uh, the product at the end is the same uh, relative to not having carbon di diversion. And so you're, you're just changing the balance of producing more methane gas rather than CO2 in the front of the plant. So. Thank you very much. I think we have to leave it at this. Uh, let's give him another round of applause, please.